Would you like to introduce yourself to our community? Sure. <laughs> um, I'm Stephanie Parker. I'm happy to be here at Sunderland. I come um, from, I live in Wendell with my family and I have a vast background in special education. Um, that's where I kind of started to get into administration recently. So thank you. Good to be here. Welcome. And uh, Dr. Laura Ramsey is here too. Uh, our first item on the agenda is reviewing and approving the minutes of September 24th, 2024. I'll motion to approve the minutes. I'll second. Any discussion? No, all right, we need to do a roll call vote since um, we are hybrid for members. Joe? Joe Ice, yes, I approve them. Thank you. <laughs> Jessica, yes. Amanda? Yes. All right, approved 3 0. Financial statement and warrants. Excellent. So, since the last meeting, we have processed eight warrants totaling $59,841.03. Um, Shelly sent the expense reports already. <coughs> I believe any of the accounts with overages were already addressed at the last meeting, but if there are questions, I'm happy to take them. Thank you. Any questions? I don't have any questions. Thank you for the report. Perfect. Thank you. <laughs> uh, principal's report, I, we're going to put that later when Mr. B is here, unless he's online. No, yeah, he's okay. running late. Okay. The clue shop, the girls went through. Okay. Um, so then I would like to open the floor to public comment. Hi. Call on Holly first and then we'll take online public comment. Okay. I'm Holly Johnson. Um, I live in Wheatley. I'm here to speak on, to represent the CPAC, the Special Education Parent Advisory Council for our district. Um, I believe that the CPAC sent you all a letter concerning the changes to the homeschooling policy. I'm not going to reread the letter, but I have some comments. Um, in addition to that. So according to the Massachusetts law, uh, a school committee needs to establish the Parent Advisory Council on Special Education, and our duties include advising the school committee on matters that pertain to the education and safety of students with disabilities, which is why I'm here tonight. So that means that our duties include advising the school committee on any matter that affects disabled students, not just education or education laws, but any matters. Um, the homeschooling policy, the changes that are proposed, this will affect disabled students that are homeschooled and families that may be considering homeschooling. And we oppose the proposed changes to the policy. There are many reasons a family decides to homeschool their disabled children. It can be hard to get our children the resources and individuals learning they need to thrive in school. Disabled children are also more likely to be bullied. There are bullying policies in place, but they are not always effective. In these cases, families choose to homeschool to keep their child safe. This proposed policy change could potentially force them to choose between safety and their child's desire to participate in school-sponsored activities. Some have said that homeschool families are not a part of the district community. I respectfully disagree. Legally, the school district has to approve and provide oversight of homeschooling, with a focus on whether instruction and progress equals that between the public schools. In addition, when a disabled student is homeschooled, the state still requires the district to provide evaluations and IEP services to those students. They are also included in the number of eligible special education students for federal funding. IEP students come to the school for services, including socialization. Whether they are enrolled in the school or not, all students, including homeschoolers, are a part of this community and deserve the opportunity to participate in these activities. Thank you. Thank you. Would you like to make a public comment? Please. Hi, sorry I'm late. I didn't know where the library was. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks for yeah, having me. Um, I'm Ashley. I'm a mother. I'm a nurse in the community. Um, I wanted the committee to know that a family informed me their student was told on three separate occasions this academic year he was not allowed to participate in extracurricular activities. This highlights a potential bias underlining this policy proposal and raises concerns about the ethical implications of school leaders practicing policies discretionarily. As the su superintendent spoke of us versus them at the committee meeting on Tuesday, 
it became clear how our community is establishing a precedence by this policy for exclusion, lacking diversity of thought, consideration of others, as well as for community arrangement. Historically, exclusion, especially when unsubstantiated, has caused significant harm, not only to those being excluded, but rippling into the community. This policy is weaponizing an opportunity for our, community, our community's children. As a family affected by this policy, we have taken the time to review the handbook and policies, as well as the commitment of the district. And I wanna share my informed reason for opposing it. First, the district's justification has been minimal. More importantly, it lacks the concrete objective rationale needed to justify drastic measures of excluding an entire group of community children whose parents do have a legal protection. Second, it negatively impacts a group of community's children, yet stakeholders in this decision were not made aware or invited to engage in discussion. A notable example of this was the lack of engagement with CPAC. While CPAC is parent-led, its district required, set forth by the Department of Education with regulations, mandating CPAC's participation in the development and evaluation of district initiatives that impact children with needs. There are current special education students whose learning needs have not been fully met by the public school system, particularly those whose neurotypes do not align with the singular model offered by public schools. CPAC represents those children and my child is one of them. Although we planned for our child to attend our town school, he faced significant challenges each year due to his disability. Despite the supportive care of teachers and therapists, his progress was limited and bullying was a serious concern. Homeschooling was not our original plan. It wasn't convenient nor was it an easy choice, but it was necessary since the public school model did not meet his needs, even with special education. Although my child is no longer enrolled in the public school, the Massachusetts Department of Education still recognizes him as a lawful student in our community. And our superintendent has certified that our home edu education plan is equal to the education provided to students attending Frontier Regional and Union 38 schools in thoroughness, efficacy, and following the guidelines of Massachusetts curriculum framework. A couple other points before I finish. And moving forward with my opposition, the district did not explore less drastic alternatives or even proactive options that would have better preserved all the intentions of the stakeholders. I believe it's an extreme solution to a hypothetical problem. And at the high school level, there are only two children who are currently participating in extracurriculars. Both have met the academic standards equivalent to that of the district. And considering the speculation of unmet behavioral standards, the, the handbook does outline the tiered disciplinary response, which the district makes case by case, excluding an entire group of good standing children grossly goes outside the district's own behavior and disciplinary procedures. It leveled me to hear the district reduce homeschoolers accessing important extra, extracurricular activity and calling it rec department and suggesting they are splintering, these children are splintering the fabric of our district. I was deeply hurt by this bias and it does not describe my family and it weaponizes the extracurriculars for my child. We are a district who has adopted and committed to a curriculum of inclusion and this does not align with this. Lastly, I'd point out that enriching all of our community students we enrich the, the future for our community. Thank you. Thank you. Would you like to make a public comment? Sure. Folks oh, online, we've had more people arrive. My name is Nancy. I'm a community member and in my home, one child is enrolled in the district school and one is a special needs child who is homeschooled. Both children are involved in the community and in extracurricular activities. I oppose the policy change that will impact homeschooled children for many reasons. First, our homeschooled child is allowed to participate and has done nothing wrong, and there is no way for us to justify this change to him, all of a sudden telling him he can't do these things. 
Second, our family followed all the required steps to have the homeschool plan approved and authorized by the district. I oppose the change because it impacts children in the community and there was no time or space created for prior discussion. I oppose this change because it goes against the district's signed commitment to equity. I oppose this change because no other alter alternatives were explored or discussed. I oppose this change because district educated children who can't meet the academic and behavioral standards go through a tiered approach to disciplinary disciplinary action and remedial opportunities. I oppose this change because there has not been any objective reason given. This leaves a lot of unanswered questions. Finally, I oppose this change because unjustified unjust exclusion of a group of children feels discriminatory. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody online who would like to make a public comment? I see through staff members. Thank you, everybody. I will take that as a no. Uh, moving on to unfinished. Oh, yes. Yes. Quick question: Do I do a public comment here? Or are we going to discuss this policy coming soon? You're going to speak when we discuss the policy. Perfect. We, we've Thank got you. one quick item before we get there. Okay. Okay. So uh, last time, in an excess of caution, we did not vote on the handbook revisions because there was not a vote listed. We've now talked about how the agendas are going to. Uh, be a little bit more flexible. So now it's just going to say votes may be taken and it doesn't need to say on each individual agenda item that there will be a vote. So we could have done this last month. Thanks for going with it, everybody. So any dis we need to, a motion to approve the handbook revisions, which we already discussed last month. I will motion to approve. I'll second. <laughs> <laughs> any discussion? No, Joe. I vote to approve the minute or the um <laughs> the handbook changes handbook changes from uh, a month ago. Thank you, Jessica. Yes, Amanda. Yes, three zero. We've approved the handbook changes. <coughs> All right, moving on to the policies. So we have uh, a total of six policies here. I would like to pull out IHGB about homeschooling to to do that separately. So I will move that we approve policies ACA, ACAA, ACAB. Um, we are also going to approve the regional ones, ACAR and ACR. Um, those are all about non-discrimination. We, we reviewed them last month. Is there an, uh, sorry, we need a second on the motion. I will second. Amanda seconds. Any discussion on these policies that we reviewed last month? All right. All in favor, Joe. I approve the ones that we just said, except for the ones we're about. Yeah. Jessica, yes. And then we, okay. Yes. 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 And then we, yes. <laughs> All right. We've approved those. Uh, now we're going to move on to IHGB, which is about homeschooling. On Wednesday, the Waitley School Committee voted to table this, um, which means they took no action. And Frontier had a lengthy discussion, a lengthy public comment on this. Um, it, they voted to reject the changes, eight to three, but also to send it back to the Policy Review Committee. So, um, because there were concerns voiced about it, so it will go to the policy review committee and then presumably come back to us in a different form. Um, so I would like to, uh, so Megan is our policy review committee representative. She's not here right now, but she can watch this video. Um, I would like to suggest that we table this, but, um, but also talk about what our concerns are so that Megan can represent those at the policy review committee um, without taking a vote because once we vote to the table, <laughs> we can't keep talking about it. Um, just informally, Amanda, do you agree with that plan? Yes. Joe, do you agree with that plan? Yes, I like that plan. Thank okay, you. great. Wait, why don't you just vote it down so it can go back to the committee and not be tabled? Mm -hmm. That's fine with me too. I mean, it's, it's the same remember, effect. Well, remember about the long debate at Frontier, there was a concern that it could be brought back up. Where this way it dismisses it and won't be brought back up without a two double read. I wouldn't put it back on an agenda without the, the policy review committee. Do you think well, three of them are going to overrule me? You know what? You can do it. <laughs> I, it doesn't matter. Nope. Um, That's fine. I was trying to get consistency with they just. It, 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 well, it, really it really doesn't matter. I was only trying to be consistent with they You'd rather we be consistent with the frontier than Waitley? I don't care. Well, Waitley. Waitley was kind of leaning toward the idea of the way to see what Frontier was going to do. 
is how I kind of read the room on that. Okay. Was that Bob kind of was that was kind of what he was? I believe he said something like that. Okay. Well, let's leave this up to Frontier. We'll be coming up next one. So I think they tabled it, waiting to see what the Frontier was going to do. But, but I expect they but, won't untable it until it's gone through policy review. They could, right? They right. could. The concern really was the, chaotic, right? right. The concern was that someone could untable it, and I was just trying to eliminate that concern. But they can't untable it if it's not on the agenda. Correct. It doesn't matter. Huh? Right. Right. Do you want us to vote it down? No. Okay. No, I, I, don't, I don't care. Okay. Um, before we start giving our input to Megan, who's not here, Darius, do you want to say anything about this? I mean, we went through an hour and a half of discussion on, on Tuesday. Um, over again, the overview. I think I feel like many words are being turned. And when I spoke from, you know, from public comment this evening, I, I mean, I appreciate the comment, but I believe things are being misrepresented, and words of mine are being turned to um, be far, seem far more nefarious than looking at a policy and looking at how people are. Um, are represented in the district as students or not students, and so this was brought forward. I think, do we? Do we? Are you going to go into a vote debate, or are you just going to move? It sounds like people are already going to move. I, I was just thinking we would sort of say what concerns we want Megan to bring to the policy review. Okay. You can have all the space you want to say whatever you want. To say. There's no concerns at for Sun for Sunderland Elementary that I have. Okay. To policy review. There's no, it does not affect some elementary students. There are no after school activities that would have affected them at the events run by either the rec department or private organizations. So it was not, did not have an impact on uh, some elementary students. So I don't have any recommendations for this other committee from some elementary. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. All right. Joe, I know that you know a lot about sports. <laughs> would you like to go first? Yeah, I, I'd like to go first. I also like to maybe ask some rhetorical questions or just some clarification because I think public comment has been very supportive and helpful, but I think there's some confusion out there. I think Darius just mentioned one thing that I like to just confirm and make clear. I think you made it pretty clear there, but just for the public, this only affects sponsored events by front the school district, staff, administrators, it does not affect youth sports, not even youth sports that have Frontier in their name, like Frontier Youth Football or Frontier Field Hockey. It only affects sponsored events from an, an administrator and staff by the school. Is that correct, Eric? Correct. Right. Thank you. The next one was um, the grandfather. The, there is clause in there also about grandfather. I think people either misread or skipped, but... Current school, if, if the policy was pushed through or whatever, um, you know, current students involved are grandfathered in until they finish school. Is that correct? Yeah, but it wasn't written in the policy. That, that was okay. one of those things where I let a student know who was concerned about that, that that would happen. Um, it's one of those things where it's, it's, it could have been added to the policy, I guess, but at this point, kind of. Yeah. Okay. And then the question about grandfathering for the committee review would be, where does grandfathering begin if they put it back, if they put it in? You know, is it for seventh grade to 12th grade? Or if a, if a first grader is participating in uh, specials right now, does that grandfather them in throughout their schooling career? Is that just a rhetorical? Um, I mean, you can write it into the policy any way you want, and so you've got concerns right. on that, so we can send that to the policy subcommittee if sure. they end up going that direction. I don't think they will, but um, yeah. if they were to go that direction, they could talk, talk about what grandfathering means. Usually it means you, you are particip you're not taking away a privilege that um, you are engaged in. In Frontier right. being a separate district, um, you wouldn't be able to... By policy, grandfather someone in from an, I mean, grandfather someone from an elementary school into a secondary illegally, I would imagine. But again, I'm, I'm giving a legal opinion. I'm not an attorney, but that's what my okay. understanding would be. It's a separate school district. That makes sense. That makes sense. And then just back to my understanding for the elementary or for Sunderland, um, the policy allows students currently to do a 
special music, art, PE, library, computers. Uh, how many students in Sunderland participate that right now or have in the last five years that are homeschooled? How many have chosen to try those? We have not had any homeschooled students. Um, actually, check that. Usually, that is an IEP team's decision. So, if um, a student, for example, has um, uh, social skills on their grid, that service at times has happened through a lunch bunch or recess with the support of one of our related service providers. Um, and, you know, we have worked with families depending on the time of the day that student was available, um, you know, whether it's AM or PM. And if it happened to fall that a special was during that time, um, that student would go has would have gone to that special as well. But it just it depends. But it was it was considered a, a, a grid service. That might be our, so I, can I just add on to that, Joe? That might be our recent history here in Sunderland. My experience as an elementary music teacher in other districts, I did have homeschool students who were just dropped off in the middle of the day to come to my music class. Mm -hmm. So I think if we had a homeschool family push for that and we looked around at what the policies were, I think we would have to allow it. So even though it hasn't been the practice, currently I think that would be allowed. And then the question would be, because I know the homeschool curriculum goes to Darius for approval. If they wanted to participate in co-curriculars or specials, would they put that into their curriculum that they submit to Darius? They essentially could. Um, they, they would approve it or not approve it. Okay. And then, um, again, I, I, I know homeschool kids need socialization. They need some specials that they don't get at home. I get that. Um, the only thing I, I want also the policy to review is just, I know there's there's eligibility, academic eligibility and social eligibility for in-school kids to participate in co-curriculars. For example, if a football player got caught with a DUI, he would be off the football team. I just want to make sure that it's, it's fair for in-school students' eligibility is equal somehow to homeschool students' eligibility. And I know it's hard because kind of the, the review of the curriculum for homeschool is, is once a year, is that correct? Correct. Right, meanwhile, uh, in-school student athlete or student performing arts um, person really has review every time grades come out. And so that's a challenge to be equitable to the in-school kids in terms of eligibility versus a homeschool student who could do things that would not be eligible if they were in school. Does that make sense, my point that I hope is reviewed? Yep. Okay. To me, it does. I don't know. Yeah, and I think that was covered pretty thoroughly at the Frontier meeting on Tuesday. Yes. Okay. Um, and again, I understand the difference between the elementary and then the and Frontier. And again, I was on Frontier's committee last year, so I, 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 I'm not in there now, but I just wanted to throw those points out there so the policy review will hear them and Megan will hear them as well. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thanks, Joe. Amanda, do you have any concerns that you want Megan to take the policy review? Um, I just want to reiterate that, first of all, I don't think that we're a community that excludes. I love this community. Um, you know, my daughter is now in sixth grade and every step of the way we've felt supported. And I attribute that to not only everybody in this room, but everybody within our communities. And I don't think that there's any intention to purposefully exclude anybody. And I hope that's true. And I, I believe that that's true. I also just want to say thank you for coming and participating because we are here to represent the voices of our community. And without hearing what you have to say, we don't know all the time. So we appreciate the input and feedback. I think there's a couple things here that are well above our decision making. Um, I watched the video from Frontier and I 100% agree that this is a policy issue and if we can all get behind it and push the state for more funding 
to help support homeschoolers and extracurriculars along the way that's going to help everybody. Um, I think at the elementary level, I love the fact that we are inclusive. And I know kids that are not full-time students here that come here for specials and it's and how important that is for them. And so um, my heart says, <laughs> I don't want to exclude anybody. Um, coming from a business background, I understand <laughs> that there's a lot of layers here that aren't just personal. Um, this is a public school, but there, it has to be run in a certain way because we only do have so many resources and so much funding available. And so I just hope that in going back to rewrite this policy, we keep in mind what we have for resources and how we want to present ourselves to the community um, and how the community in turn might be able to help us out at the same time. And so I think I, I share the concern over eligibility requirements. I think that if we're going to continue doing this, adding some additional guardrails to make sure it is fair across the board is important. Um, and, you know, I would hope that down the road and at the state level, perhaps there could be a bigger, broader discussion um, to universally support um, schools that are as inclusive financially, um, because that is the one piece that I also have a concern of is that we are limited resources um, in the public school system. And so although we have a, a small number, this does also set a precedent across the state. And so I just, you know, it's a, it's a tough situation and I don't know that anybody really wins um, except for um, to, to come up with something that makes sense and is fair for everyone. So that's where I stand on that. Thanks, Amanda. Yeah. Um, my general thoughts on this policy, I had an opportunity to voice with the Frontier Committee on Tuesday night. The only thing I want to add, um, recognizing that this is a very minority opinion based on the discussion that day, um, I would be perfectly happy with no changes, including I'm not concerned about um, academic and attendance qualifications for homeschool students to participate in our extracurriculars. Um, and my thinking on that is that if a kid is being homeschooled, it's not their decision. The quality of their homeschool education is up to their adults. If their adults are failing them and they are you know, not getting an academically rigorous experience at home, why would I also want to cut them off from extracurriculars? Our, you know, education is not just academics. If those kids are <coughs> being shortchanged in some really meaningful ways in their life, I don't want them cut off from our extracurriculars. So I would be in favor of um, no accountability on those personally, and I, expe I expect I'm in the extreme minority. <laughs> Anybody want to add anything else? All right. I make a motion to table. <laughs> Policy I'll, IHGB. I'll second. Any further right. discussion? All right, Joe. Uh, I approve to table it. Jessica, yes. Amanda? Yes. Thank you. The motion, the policy is tabled. Moving on to new business, capital planning. All right, new capital planning. Well, hang on, you know what? I'm going to present it really. I can't see it at home. Um, can someone uh, online tell us that they can see that? They should be able to assist us on our setting. Um, so basically, when we look at their capital planning, you know, we t right now the backwards and rooms are still in progress. Are they still in progress? All right, uh, it's only funny because they were going to be installed many, many, many times. Yeah. Um, the, basically, what we decided to do is we, we put on, we have a lot of ones here, and I don't think the ones, all these numbers are realistic um, that we can have this many ones this year. Last year, we did have access to ARPA funds um, and other funding from the town. Um, but, you know, when we were putting the list together, we kept it as one and then there was some question of whether it would be like one B, like maybe we'll be able to get some other, if we can find other uh, funding sources outside of just town warrant or town capital. But um, I think without coming from the administration, I think the number one um, thing that we're looking at is to continue with the AC mini splits in the classroom. And even that $90,000 price tag is pretty steep going to the town. Um, you know, right now the way we have the, the phase is broken up. Um, Please work. It does. 
No, I want clips. Clipboard, are we? There we go. Um, you know, here's the phases of our in our school. And so going to phase three, um, I'm sorry, phase the yellow phase rather, phase two. Um, Am I saying that right? Why is it say phase, phase two? You, you are. So, um, so we phase one was taken care of this past summer. Um, phase two would um, take care of uh, all of the classrooms and a couple other spaces. Right. And so that's you know, and the size of that project obviously ninety thousand dollars. Possibly, if the rebates stay the same, you get forty percent of that back. Um, you know, that could be. Uh, you know, the town might be able to get onto that, but if they, if we start having discussions with them and that number's too high, we could also drop some classrooms, you know what I mean? Make it a, a, make a, make a, a four phase project or, and so forth. So I just wanted to kind of say that out loud, um, what we're looking at there. Um, at the same time, you know, we're talking with the energy committee, um, the town of Deerfield did just get a green communities grant for $180,000, I think $140,000, I'm pulling the numbers out of the air, but like a good 140,000 of that is the BMS system at Deerfield Elementary. And so it would be great to be able to find, follow that, um, what they did there. If we can do the same thing here, we, we can get the BMS system replaced here under a grant. Um, the classroom floors, now these are ongoing, um, these are ongoing projects that we've been doing. We've been doing a few each year. Um, we added that we have to do we have to add asbestos co testing costs to that as we found as we uh, pull different parts of this building apart asbestos has been used in different areas and when you talk about and i don't want anytime the word asbestos gets said people get very nervous but asbestos can be in like the um, adhesive that's holding the tile to the floor so it's not floating around the hallways that there's no danger to the, the children or any of that sort but when you go to remove the tile to put a new thing down you're releasing that um that adhesive there could t technically become, um, uh, uh, what do you call it, aerosol because of the you know the small particles that can be inhaled and that kind of stuff. And it just has to be removed properly when they do that. Um, and then looking at the re replace the bathroom floors near the library and replace the toilet partitions in the library. Um, originally, I think we had those put together, redo the whole bathroom, but I think we're breaking that up so that we can chip away at it. Um, the other thing that was on the list that we, we basically talked about a little bit at the last meeting was the roof engineering study. Um, and talking about, you know, this roof probably can go, um, we can we can limp along for a while, but it has to be on the um, the radar for the capital committee with the towns. But that roof engineering would be around $20,000, whether or not that comes from a school ask or the town ask um, is, is it a question. And I'm just going to talk about a few of these other ones because they, they have come up in conversation. We had talked about the, the stamping. So our, our walkways to the building right now, they, they look like they're brick, but they're actually stamped um, asphalt. And we've had to do some patches as you probably walked in, you saw that. Um, really the whole thing needs to be redone at some point. Some of the gaps between in that asphalt would be um, not conducive to someone in a wheelchair because of the amount a bump. We're lucky that most of the splits have not turned to this. Those watching at home um, have not gone from uneven. They're really still pretty even in most things. But um, at one point, we thought we would get a safe schools to see uh, safe. What is it called? Safe schools grant, or the town was going to be able yeah. to come up with some money. Um, that fell through. So it's kind of back on our um, back on our radar. All right. And then we're talking about the, the roof itself after the study is a, you know, just under a half a million dollar project. Okay, right, so that's kind of where the, where we ended up coming back as this year looking at um, capital. So questions, comments, concerns, thoughts? Thank you. I, we, I still appreciate this tool. That's a well-organized list. Thank you for that. I have a few inconsequential questions. Okay. Um, I've never seen that diagram of the phases of the where the um, mini splits are getting put in what would how were those classrooms selected because they're kind of scattered yeah they're um, completely scattered so um <laughs> and but it was purposeful purposely scattered. We pull it up yeah, because, right? and I'll so because it makes sense when you explain um 
We, uh, room, I guess the, on the top there, room, room six, um, that housed one of our summer programs. Mm -hmm. And so we had that space done a few years ago. Mm -hmm. um, then we had the library done um, two summers ago and that helps with the, the server room as well. And then this past year, so what you see in yellow, uh, bottom right, we uh, prioritized early childhood. Um, so to take care of those classes during that time. And then from there, as best we could, we tried to go uh, every other um, across the building so that on the stifling hot days that uh, adjacent classrooms could open the door you can see the little doorways and all right. that. So open they the can door open the door so that and spread you can the, spread some of the uh, coolness from one classroom to the other. Spread the coolness from one classroom to the other. And a couple of these other spaces did have wall units, um, and that's why we had delayed we delayed those as well. So there was kind of a method behind the madness. Thank yeah. I assume there yes. was. I wanted to know what it was. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and it looks nice, colorful like that. <laughs> yeah. Very elementary yeah. school. Yeah. <laughs> Um, one of my surprises coming to school committee work was how often we have to replace toilet partitions and doors. Oh. It seems like it's about every other year. So is there any way to like uh, get more durable ones? I don't know. Um, you know, they, there's a lot of traffic that goes through the bathrooms and it's a, also a place of wonder and mischief at times. Mm -hmm. and so we, <laughs> Well, uh, it is, right? And so we have to um, help uh, coach and remind students about appropriate bathroom use with the partitions, and it's not a, a jungle gym. Yeah. Yeah. So, but that's, no, but that's, that's, that's that, that is the nature of it, um, you know. Well, and also, the, uh, it's way too much detail. You're asking a detailed question. Um, They've actually, the new petitions that are coming out now are actually more urine resistant to the corrosion that was occurring when um, accuracy a, was an issue. That, that, that too is an issue. I'm glad I brought this up. There you go. <laughs> you went there with your, I don't try to outdo you. <clears throat> Amanda and Joe, any other questions? <laughs> no. All right. Thank you. Uh, moving on to appointing an MASC delegate. So Amanda and I are both, well, I'm definitely attending. Amanda will know <coughs> tomorrow whether she's attending. Amanda, do you know what the delegate does? No. Okay, so I have been the delegate the last three years. I would be happy to share the joys. Great. Um, but basically, uh, MASC has their own um, democratic system. It's kind of like a town meeting. Everybody comes in and um, we vote in the new officers who have already been screened by a committee, so if they're, they're a slate, it's not controversial. Um, and then we've got uh, the resolutions which have been sent out. Um, I have actually already voted on those resolutions because I served on the MASC Resolutions Committee, so I've already screened them <laughs> and voted on them. Um, but the big job of the delegate is to vote on those resolutions. Um, the delegate assembly is typically my favorite part of the conference because I love that democracy that's yeah. happening and just all of the characters from across the state who are like, you can't call point of order on a point of order. And I've learned a lot of things. Um, so I find it very entertaining. I have to be there anyway um, because of the rural schools resolution for which I'm one of the original sponsors. Um, but I would be happy for you to be our official delegate. If you are there, would you be interested in that role? Sure. Yeah. Great. So what I would like to do, Amanda won't know until tomorrow if she can actually go. I'm just saying this publicly. Um, Amanda is our first choice delegate, but if she learns tomorrow she can't go, then I will be the delegate. That is the plan. Sounds good. Thanks. All right, moving on. And pass presentation. All right. Um, Darius, will you show your screen and I'll just say click when it's time to click? Thank you. I um, have a slide deck that gives some highlights of our MCAS scores, but um, from last spring for grades three, four, five, and six. Um, but I want to say before we get started that um, I really like to approach data as a place to discover new questions. And it's not always a source of answers, especially when you're looking at one data set and we gather multiple in our district. Um, but this one is published and it was in the newspaper recently. Um, so I'm going to present it and speak to it, but I hope you'll join me in looking for questions that this raises that continue to refine our focus on things that we want to continue to do well and things we want to address because we want them to work better for our students. Um, 
So I think 93, yeah, next slide. Oh, the headlines from the state. So the interim commissioner um, had a talk with school leaders just to say statewide that the 2024 MCAS scores show a plateau or a decline in all major categories since the pandemic. And this was, um, this was actually, I think, a surprise this year. There was a feeling that maybe things would be turning around because we are four years out and there's been so many recovery efforts um, to close gaps, and yet we're still seeing a real shift, um, which could be explained by lots of things, not just in school, but outside of school as well. Um, across the state, the correlation between income and achievement is um, widespread and concerning, and you'll see that reflected at Sunderland as well. And um, the role of absenteeism remains a challenge uh, across the board for recovery efforts. There is a correlation statewide between absenteeism and achievement. Students who are absent more overall um, don't have as high achievement as students who are present for the majority of school days. So those are just some things as you think about Sunderland in context. And we're, we're not the same as the state in every way. Next slide. So we had 93 students participate, uh, um, yeah, which is 99% of the students who could have participated. That means that when we're looking at a shift in um, percentiles from last year to this year, 1% um, is about one student, more or less. Um, so it's easy in a small school to have a, uh, a, a home for a dip, and it represents a sixth grade class that is outgoing and a third grade group that is incoming. Um, um, so yeah, it, as, as our number of test takers gets smaller, the sample size is less representative, we need to look at trends over time um, and trends in the district at large. So Sunderland performed slightly better than state average um, in all categories, um, although it, like the state, had a, a dip, I uh, believe, maybe not in math, but we'll look at that in a minute. Um, our accountability rating was substantial progress towards targets, which is very good. Um, um, other schools in our district and in our area have moderate progress or insufficient progress. Not no one in our district has insufficient progress, but substantial is significant. I think Ben will get a certificate at some point and um, that with 58% of our targets being met. And those are set by the MCAS board. They're not in school targets at all. <coughs> so here are just a few um, highlights. The blue is exceeding expectations and the green is meeting expectations. So when you combine the blue and the green, you get the percentage of students who are meeting or exceeding, which is scoring over 500 on MCAS. So in ELA, um, the Sunderland is at 44 percentile and the state is at 39. In math, Sunderland is at 43 and the state is at 41, meeting and exceeding. And in science, 54% of fifth graders, because only fifth graders take this test, are meeting and exceeding. Um, this graph does not include eighth graders, even though it says it does. Um, it, because if we don't have any grades, if there was a zero factor going into those columns, um, and at the state level, um, it was 45%. So this has been um, a, a wonderful thing um, that since the um, equity audit a couple of two years ago, one of the top priorities was investing in a data system for the district that could disaggregate uh, performance and growth by subgroup and put different filters on our performance in all kinds of areas. So the district did purchase open, open architects, and this is our first year of exploring it. Um, we have multiple dashboards, not just MCAS. We have um, attendance dashboards and Dibbles dashboards and um, uh, NWEA dashboards. But I use the new dashboard to look at ELA and some things that are worth knowing. When you disaggregate the subtests in ELA and look at the reading and language tests, we did much better than in writing. So um, our reading and language scores are higher than state average. 73% um, of sixth graders and 74% of fifth graders met and exceeded expectations in those two subcategories. Third grade performed above state average in all ELA subcategories with 79% of the students meeting and exceeding expectations in just reading, which is one of four categories. The four categories are reading, language, writing, and essays. Um, we have a gender gap in terms of achievement, where 51% of girls met and exceeded expectations in ELA and 35% of boys met and exceeded expectations. And um, 
Writing is the subcategory of the LA that pulled down our average scaled score. This is consistent across our district and other schools. Writing is the subcategory that pulled down our average and it's consistent across the state. So writing is an area on which we are currently focused. And also we need to look more at the difference between girls' um, achievement and boys' achievement and also growth percentiles. Um, and I would add that I uh, noticed that the boys, uh, girls did better in their writing and the boys did more poorly in their writing specifically as opposed to the reading. So thinking about boys and writing emerges as a place to focus our attention. Um, a closer, yeah, please, thanks. A closer look at math. Um, in subcategories, math shows no one area of particular strength or weakness across the grades. And what I mean by that is um, one subclass is geometry, one is number in base 10, one is operations in algebraic thinking, one is uh, measurement in data, and in each grade level, a different category was the one where kids were ex excelling and a different category was the one where kids were struggling. So there was no, you couldn't look at our curriculum or our program and say, oh, we're, our, our materials are really good for operations and algebraic thinking, but not for data and measurement. It was um, varied grade by grade and also close to the center. There wasn't as wide of a range. Um, third grade did stand out with 71% of students meeting and exceeding expectations in math overall. So that was an outlier um, and high scoring. And in math, 41% um, of girls are meeting met and exceeded expectations and 43% of boys did. That is um, a very close, um, probably not a significant percentile difference when you're looking at it statistically, even though we have a small sample size, so I would still use that caution. Um, I feel like I'm talking a lot and maybe other people, <laughs> I could just keep going, but I feel like I should look around. And, <laughs> This is helpful. I'm following it all. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Okay, great. So this is me showing off the new software. Um, <laughs> so we can see how student growth in math is correlated with race and income over time. So the graphs look different because we have a different number of variables. Um, when we're looking at the growth of students, um, and growth the means races. how much did students increased their score compared to peers in similar sized schools that scored similarly last year. So it's, they try to do apples to apples, um, but to a rural district with about 93 people, about 100 students taking the test. Um, and so you can see from 2019 that all of our students um, had a dip until 2021 and we're coming back. We're peaking in 2023 and then had a little dip this year. And you can see that the growth is fairly consistent, like the gap between the lines. Um, it does look as though um, uh, students who are white have had higher growth over time, but not at a different rate. So I don't know if that makes sense, but people are rising and falling and, um, in relation to their own score, in, in relation to their own performance at a similar rate. <coughs> and when you look at the math, um, oh, wait. Oh yeah, no, they did do this right. Okay, two math scores, right? So one was um, about race and then the second one is about income. And you can see that there is a significant uh, growth. This is a growth, this is achievement, I beg your pardon. I can just, no, it is growth, okay. You can see that the growth, making sure I did everything, that the growth followed a similar pattern that um, it sank lower for students who were low income in 2021 and then it climbed higher and we are now having a dip that is about the same spread apart so the growth was catching up at one point and is falling has fallen off this year but fallen off at the same rate not privileging um one income over the other in terms of growth you'll see that our achievement is really wide but the growth is parallel thank you um joe had a question all right th thank you doctor um yeah, the statistics and the charts are really uh, interesting to look at. Um, one question is, and we, we compare to similar size and things, we're really pretty diverse elementary school with the demographics, with the college, with uh, transient workers. I, it must be really hard to really get a good comparison on those areas. Um, I just want to make that statement. And then the other question I had was, uh, 
were you able to look at this? I know we piloted the new math curriculum in several classrooms last year. Was there were any of them uh, MCAS tested? Mm -hmm. uh, did we? Did you see any improvement based on the new pilot? It's hard to do. It's only one year. But did, did the the math pilot seem to be favorable? I understand your question. I did not dial down into the classroom level um, to okay. look at teachers who did or didn't implement Bridges as a pilot last year on MCAS, but I did do that with the spring scores on um, NWEA. And there was a difference between teachers who were implementing the new curriculum and teachers who weren't. But one year does not tell you anything. You, it could have just been the kids in the class. Um, it could have. We would have to look, I really like uh, looking at things over time when a school this small and knowing that the numbers of students who are, you know, in the multi-racial or other category are not, not that many. I really think it's best to look at trends over time before understanding what our curriculum is doing to close gaps. Um, and, but, um, but it did look like there was a, a benefit to the new curriculum after even a pilot year. That's not typical either, so I am also cautious. Usually um, in the first year of a new curriculum, scores decline because teachers are not going at a pace where you cover as much material the first year. Typically the learning curve just makes it a little harder to know what to emphasize and when to move ahead and teachers taking their time to make sure that they set up all the materials for the first time. Usually we don't get as far the first year and the scores reflect that. Um, I say we, I mean in general, that's been my experience in other schools. So the jury's still out. Sure, sure. I agree. You know, one year's one year. But subjectively, there was a lot of um, pluses and a lot of positive feedback on the new pilot last year. So yeah. it's good to see the objective scores supported some of that. Yeah. I would also say that um, there was enthusiasm from the teachers about the program who, who piloted it last year. Sure. So this is our first year of of asking everyone to do it. And so in some ways it's year one again, and I just want to keep that in mind for this year and next year and to be thoughtful of the teachers who are right now in the what, seventh or eighth week of school and really feeling it to have two new curriculums, um, two relatively new curriculums to manage at once. So we are doing something big and hard in terms of that. Thank you very much. Yeah. We definitely support those teachers. It is a lot, you and I talked about before too, curriculums but they're doing a great job they are Thanks. yeah mm -hmm. okay next slide so now we can look at growth in ELA correlated with race and income it looks a little different um, you can see that there was a sharp decline um, after the pandemic and for our Hispanic population that climbed back up in 2022 both in math um, well in math and that our low-income students had the same dip um, in ELA, and for me that raises questions about, um, you know, what what can school offer students who are multilingual that what wasn't being able to be offered in that year in 2021, um, and what does school offer students with low income that wasn't able to be accessed in 2021, um, because the same students were taking the test in 22 and 23. So that line came up quite a lot. And I'm noticing that in 2024, um, there was more growth in low-income students than there was in non-low-income students. You can see the blue line going up and that's sort of a plateau for non-low-income students. So. And the, the 2021 school year, that's when we had a hybrid model. Mm -hmm. right? Yes. So that, I mean, if you, if you think about it, that year compared to everything else was right. substantially different. Yep. Right. You know this original 2020 because we were right. home then, right? Um, but I just think it's good to, when we think about does school have the power to close equity gaps, it makes me think yes. You know, just yep. that coming to school, we, we can stay optimistic about our power to make a, a difference. Correct. I think one of the things that also to consider is that when you're <clears throat> looking at subgroups that are so small, Mm -hmm. And we were talking about this uh, in a meeting recently about if you have in a school this size, if you're testing and the testing has 12 Hispanic students and four of them are EOL learners, or, or, and is that a fair characterization or of, you know, right. it, it, they just have to be Hispanic and that, 
versus right. other groups that may not be shown within the graphs because we don't have enough of a population. So yeah. it's like, it is data diving. So one of us sometimes makes us lead to another. And then we get right down to like, who, what? Oh, okay, that makes sense. That's yeah. why we saw a drop. Yeah. Or we keep digging because we can't find out why it makes sense. Yeah. And so kind of dismissing those outliers. <coughs> Is the low income classification still based on free and reduced lunch applications? Even the school I think it's a more complex formula than okay. that. Good. Yeah, I don't actually understand the formula, but I know that there's more data points than that that go into that designation and that we don't check a box for MCAS. MCAS checks the box for us on that. Like the state has that level of information on our students and it doesn't come from us. I believe so. No, 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 I mean, it originally comes from us. It okay. originally comes yeah, from yeah, us? Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. We, we, we would update, we would upload. Um, so it come from mass, but ownership. it comes from things like mass health. Like they, so it they is free and reduced lunch. Well, well, not only that, not the formers, but they also have the ones that are already in the system now. But like, I don't think we say who has what insurance, but I think the state does use that to somewhat determine. I could be wrong. I'll look into it. But I think that the state does use multiple data points to figure yep. out free and reduced, not just one thing. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. And with um, lunch being free for all students right, right, right now, um, we do encourage families to fill out the forms regardless at the beginning of the year, but we still don't have everyone filling out forms who might qualify. Correct. If you're not so, receiving assistance from, if you're not receiving yeah. assistance from the state, and let's say you're recently um, falling into that uh, income category, you may not be in. It may not okay. be in our system or their system. Okay. Yeah. That's true. Thank you. Let's see. What's next? <laughs> Nobody knows it's coming. <laughs> oh, look at this. Okay, this is the achievement gap in income in math in ELA. So 18% versus 21% <coughs> in ELA and 21% of students meeting and exceeding expectations versus 55%. So just to clarify again, previously we were looking at growth trends, com students compared to students similar to themselves in the previous year. Um, and now we're looking at actual achievement. So what, what percentage of questions students got right? Not 18%, but 18% were um, meeting and exceeding expectations versus 57% meeting and exceeding expectations. Next slide. So some takeaways for Sunderland are, um, I offer these and then I'm happy to hear more thoughts. Higher achievement than state average in ELA math and science. But as we know, a dip from the state overall. Um, not a dip for Sunderland overall, though. Um, similar growth among student subgroups. Reading scores are significantly higher than writing scores. Significant achievement gap correlated to income levels and still not where we were pre pandemic. Some of the next steps that I'm talking about with um, colleagues and teachers are. Um, continuing to focus on achievement gaps, of course, and can focus on improved writing outcomes. But specifically, I'm wondering about alternate models for the summer support. Um, one of the things the commissioner said is, based on the plateau or decline in all major areas, that he expected this to be a big um, summer, of, uh, you know, there'd be a strong drive to do some more recovery efforts over the summer. But what we found last year is that um, we offered a robust program, like a three-week program, and um, to um, four times as many students as actually enrolled. Parents were not eager to sign their kids up for it, or kids weren't eager to come, um, especially compared to post-pandemic right away. There was a big push, like, we want our kids back in school. We want our kids to, quote, unquote, catch up. And it just, our model did not attract families. It also didn't attract teachers. And we tried different things to attract teachers, um, but teachers need a break. It's a different world teaching right now. It's um, exhausting in ways that it wasn't pre-pandemic. And so um, I'm thinking that we need to start the conversation about what else can we do to offer support to students who need more support that's more appealing to kids, families, and teachers. Um, coincidentally, in terms of curriculum review, this is the year that I am reviewing. Um, I'm with the, um, with the committee of reviewing digital literacy and computer science, and we've just been talking about the role of keyboarding because an expert that came to visit our team, um, for, an expert for the state, Melissa Zeitz, was explaining why many schools are moving towards keyboarding in second grade. 
I know their hands are small and the keyboards are too big, but the, um, the keyboards don't always ask for proper fingering. They're helping kids learn to hunt and peck. And with everything moving towards digital and um, with students um, often having the accommodation of move to keyboarding earlier and earlier for different reasons, does it save a cognitive step that, um, or, or reduce the multitasking that's involved in having an idea, organizing it, getting your hand to form the letters and writing? And we would never do this because of our MCAS scores. We're not driven that way. But um, our students being frustrated as writers because it is hard to get their writing out. And is MCAS helping us pay attention to that? You know, from a, we have a state person telling us that this might be a trend and we have some MCAS scores making us wonder. So I think that that'll be an area for research and exploration um, if there is a benefit to um, doing more keyboarding practice before third grade. I know it is tough on third grade teachers to start keyboarding in the fall and put their kids on tests in the spring. It just feels very compressed. But then again, you don't want to do things in second grade because of what they have to do in third grade. You want to let kids be non-typing kids for as long as possible. Um, so there's a lot of thought to be put into that. Um, I'm eager to look at the impact of the new curriculum over time. Both programs in ELA and math were chosen um, in part because they prioritized equity. Um, considerations and so when we look at our income gap I would hope that this new curriculum over time would change that I think that there's a lot of other things that obviously make a difference um, to that to the achievement gap but I would I do believe that schools can change it um, and so I'm hoping that this is a big step and um, continue data meetings so this is a new data tool and I got to show off some of the things we could do with it and um, I haven't gotten to go as far as I would like. This course just came out on September 24th, and there's a lot more to think about in different constellations of people, admin teams and grade level teams and instructional leadership teams, strategic leadership teams. So um, that's my report. Thank you. Questions? Uh, when will SES families see their own children's reports? I got mine today. I got mine from Frontier, but not Sunderland. Those are elementary school reports uh, were scheduled to be mailed out tomorrow. Snail mail? Snail mail. Okay. Yes. It came electronically for Frontier. Yeah. You know, we um, had learned after the fact, and this is, and Lila being so organized, had prepped all the envelopes and um, right. stamped. And so we're... Stamped, said, folded, and put in. Yep. Yeah, right. um, <laughs> so moving forward, that's, that is our plan to do it electronically. She yeah. won't mind next yeah. year at all. No, no not <laughs> at all. And we'll be, yeah, it's probably already prepared for it. <laughs> Thanks, Miss Lila. <laughs> yep. All right. Thank you so much. Uh, we wanted to talk about kindergarten class size. Yeah, I think um, you, you and I had talked about this, Jessica, and Ben and I have talked about this. Um, there's been a lot of talk in the community because they, we've had a fluctuating um, kindergarten class, a class that went down to 19, got up to 21, got to 22, then went back to 21. Now it's back up to 22. Um, and there's talk that we may have some more new arrivals in our community that uh, uh, three or four that could make that number go up to um, maybe perhaps 25. 25 yeah. um, the information that we've received about people moving in has been inconsistent from the beginning of the school year. And so um, the, the plan in place right now is we have an administrative team that's keeping an eye on it, talking with the teachers um, and such, and looking at we are watching it and monitoring it. And the addition to, if it gets to a size of a class, the number one thing where we immediately jumps to is, you know, are you gonna split the class? And that's really is going to depend on what the ultimate size ends up being, also what the needs of the students are. Right now, there's a lot of adult sport in that classroom. Um, the classroom itself is running very smoothly, um, even in compared to, you know, from behaviors and whatnot, it is very, it's a very, it's a very good class. That's an important thing to happen. Um, I think the some community members have been, um, you know, kind of a, uh, concerned or um, out of their comfort zone because the, you have a class size that's around twenty, um, versus what we've seen in previous years where class sizes were in the low teens or even sometimes smaller than that. And I want to talk, to, you know, if I'm talking to the community on this, if that class sizes, you know. When you get too small, it feels like it's a small private 
thing that's happening, but it's not always in the best interest of students. You have a kid or if you have a class of 12 and you, your average having one or two kids out that per day, especially during flu seasons, um, that class gets very small and students don't have the diversity of students to play with, not just diversity that are different, but diversities of students that are like them. For example, a very active boy who, or boy or girl, who likes athletics, you know what I mean? Or, and they don't find some that matches their energy in a classroom, they can be very alone. So sometimes when you look at size of classes, getting to those really small numbers can, you know, can actually be counterproductive in, in those social kind of ways. Um, so anyway, so, you know, where we were pro programmatic wise, we went into July at 19. 19. Yeah. At 19, which was, a, you know, a healthy, on a, not larger size, but a fuller size number, um, but healthy. We've added a few, we've lost one, and now we're adding again. So um, I kind of introduced it then. No, I, mean, you, I think you um, really hit all the points. I, I, I do want to say that, you know, from an administrative perspective, um, we have been very involved and have had a lot of eyes um, in, in that classroom. And, uh, you know, it's certainly busy as you would expect any group of five-year-olds to be. Um, the teachers are doing a great job. Uh, the kids are happy. The kids are engaged. They are, they are learning. And it's just something that we're really keeping our, our eyes on. And, and to Darius's point, um, you know, we had a, we were at, started the school year with 21, we went up to 22 last week. We went back down to 21. And now <coughs> next week, we're having students 22 and 23 start. And so um, that number 23, we learned of that new today. So it's um, the numbers Numbers are changing. changing. We're keeping an eye on it. Um, Steph and I have been meeting with the classroom teacher regularly um, to offer and provide support and, and coaching and working with the support staff in that room as well. And, and I think, you know, one of the things that, you know, we have taken um, from this school committee um, and the way you've approached decisions over the years is to take a, a calculated approach, right? And not make decisions strictly off of emotion and we want to make sure that we have all the facts in front of us um, and and then make decisions from from there and have conversations with stakeholders with um, our, our colleagues across the board to really make sure that we are making a decision with that's that's fact based right because again as, as um, Darius mentioned like with the numbers growing that that that's a story that is a data point but it's not the entire uh, data point that we look at. And, and so um, just to throw out other numbers in the district, um, Waitley has 21 students in the kindergarten and Conway has 25 in the kindergarten, which is an anomaly year for Conway as well with the large number. But I think it's just good for people to know that it's Central is not an outlier of having a larger kindergartens right now. I don't know what happened um, four years ago or five years ago, um, but um, there's certainly more oh, kindergartens. Oh, maybe it was a pandemic. <laughs> exactly. Where was it with the time of the pandemic? Yeah, right? Was it, people were locked up too much. You know, um, it, but also to, to that point, um, we, you know, you know, you, you hear that Sunderland is a transient community and, and it is, but this is an anomaly, right? We typically do not have a grade level increase by close to 30% from the time school ends to the start of school or to October, November. Um, so, th so this is different. You know, um, our current first grade class uh, was close to the 19 number of enrolled going into the summer and we didn't really have any growth from there. So it's just, it's, it's tough to plan, right? This, and that's why I think we need to um, really take a calculated approach and make decisions from there. So where this intersects with school committee is that should there be a need, um, you know, should we have administration come up with the need that we need to split the class for some reason, um, for whatever reason, meaning just size or um, need or both or that kind of thing, we don't have the um, necessary funds for to hire a second teacher right now. And based on timing and year and that kind of stuff, you know, the number just spitballing against the wall, forty to $50,000 is what we would need. And so 
How we would get that money um, is not out of the current budget. You either would have to reduce someplace else, ask the town for support, or find other alternative outside monies to help us out. So I'm putting it on the radar because it, it, if, it, if, if we have an increase to 25 or 26 going into November, it doesn't necessarily mean that the, any kind of change is going to happen immediately. We're going to have to evaluate who we have and how that's going to work. But we're going to come fast and furious to meetings with you folks. Um, well, the two of you. <laughs> well, I'll be meeting with you guys as well. But, um, um, you'll be fast and furious about it. So we want to kind of keep you abreast of what's going on so that um, you know that if it, we're going to be, have to be ready to go if we have to go to the town or we have, you know, those kind of things. Thank you for the update. I want to add that because I was doing some advocacy outside the district re related to funding, I asked if I could observe and volunteer in the kindergarten classroom. <coughs> I've been an elementary school teacher for 20 years. I've taught a lot of kindergarten, and it's really, really true that the number does not tell the whole story. I was amazed at how self-regulated these children were, how not chaotic the classroom felt, that things were going as well as I could possibly imagine them going with that many kindergartners in one room. Um, it's, it's a great group of kids and it is exceptionally well staffed. So, okay. so I've seen it with my own eyes. It's real. <laughs> yeah. Yes. So thank you, everybody. Any any questions from Amanda or Joe? Nope. Thanks for the update. We're on to reports. I don't think I need to report anything. Committee and chair. Any I have no any committee reports? Joe? No, I'm going to hold off on the collaborative. Well, we just did a lot of restructuring. So it's not very, anything very exciting. I, well, I am on the finance committee for a collaborative now, though. Nope. Fun. Congratulations. Thank you. Congratulations. <laughs> um, we missed the principal's report earlier. Can we do that now? Sure. Uh, so, number one, back to school night success. On October <coughs> 2nd, we hosted our school community for our annual back to school night celebration. It was filled with um, warmth and joy as families and staff came together to celebrate the start of another school year. This event, um, we kind of tweaked it a few years back and have followed a similar path the past couple of years. Um, it's a free pizza and salad dinner for all community members, um, teachers. It features a family portrait um, event and that's, um, one of the uh, like really big highlights of the evening, uh, we have family portraits, families get a copy, and then we also make a, um, a, a mural with the portraits on, in one of our hallways. There's a scavenger hunt and a chance for caregivers and students to visit classrooms. You know, anytime we do open the doors for uh, whether it's big or small um, events, uh, it's a huge undertaking and it really can't be done without the love, warmth, and, and planning from our teaching team. So I'm just so amazed and appreciative of everything they do on a continuous basis. And we have a new scoreboard in the Sunderland Elementary School Gymnasium. This was generously gifted by the Westbrook Veterinary Hospital along with additional financial support from Sunderland Youth Baseball and the Sunderland Rec Department. Um, it's actually absolutely wonderful and it's going to help enhance the experience um, for our Sunderland teams and those opponents who they face for, for years to come. Um, really appreciative, appreciative of, the, um, of Westbrook for this incredible donation. You know, and we hope that uh, the Sunderland Eagles come out on top, um, mm -hmm. unless they're playing my Deerfield team and then Deerfield just wins by a little um, <laughs> on those days. Sorry, Joe, in case we match up this year. Um, but no, in all seriousness, it's, um, you know, we are building wise, um, chipping away at these projects little by little and the building is showing its age in certain areas. And so as we're able to make small, um, small changes, it actually, you know, enhances things um, really building wide. My understanding is that with the donation of the scoreboard, that the school committee may need to make a motion to accept that donation. Um, is that correct? We need to vote to accept donations to the school. Great, and so that would be on the November. We'll do it on our next agenda. November, great. Um, some important dates coming up. So Sunderland Elementary School staff is going to be participating in a three-part trauma-informed teaching PD uh, series coming up. 
And that's going to be uh, focused on building safety and trust through relationships, understanding behavior through the trauma lens and teaching social emotional skills. So we're really excited for that. Our first day is this coming Friday and then we are having this at our staff meeting next week and then another date in December as well. We have some field trips, or actually picture day is tomorrow. Um, so for all of the students who are on the school committee meeting re <laughs> remotely tonight, please remember to um, wear uh, whatever your parents pick out, uh, carriers pick out. Uh, we have grade three, four going to historic Deerfield next week. Our walk and roll to school day is on the 17th, a uh, week from today actually. And also our grades five and six are going to Mike's Maze that day. And you know, these field trips, um, the cost of uh, field trips certainly does add up. And much of the funding for these trips uh, comes from either grants that Laura or our teachers apply for, um, and then our PTO. As, as well. And so our PTO is a big supporter of allowing or helping our kids go on field trips. The Hitchcock Center is going to visit grades one and two in a couple weeks. We have some school council meetings coming up. And then in November, we have our annual Veterans Day observance ceremony. And then uh, just lastly, um, I, I want to take a moment to welcome Stephanie Parker to the team here at Sunderland. Um, Steph comes to us with a huge background in special education and um, is doing an absolutely wonderful job. She's making connections with the staff, making connections with the students. And, um, you know, it's uh, and we have really seemed to hit the ground running with one another. And it's been a very positive addition to our school community. So we could not be happier with everything that Steph has done up to this point and will continue to do. And I think that's it. Thank you. Welcome. Yes. Yeah. Is that a question from Joe? Hey, Joe. Yeah, just a quick question, Ben. I, I don't know if you can answer or not, but did Mike Mays give any substantial discount for the visit um, being local? I'm honestly not sure of the expense um, per ticket to Mike's Mays, so I'm not, I'm not sure. Okay. Superintendent's report. No report, only to add on that we learned that anything on our agenda can be expected to take action on, but we're gonna add the little thing on it that says may vote or whatever it says. Votes may be taken, I appreciate that. Taken. I like yeah. that clarity. <laughs> Mistakes so, may be made. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Decisions may be made or not. We can't decide. <laughs> I like that, I think that covers all our bases. So yeah. thank you for adding oh. that. Uh, and we've reached the end of our agenda. We'll entertain a motion to adjourn. I'll motion to adjourn. I second the motion. All right. All in favor, Joe. I since I seconded the motion, yes, I agree to adjourn. <laughs> Jessica, yes. Amanda. Yes. We are adjourned at 618. Thank you, everybody.